Myanmar is a dynamic country with over 135 ethnicities, languages and cultures. As part of a crucial step towards democratization, Myanmar held elections in 2015. Myanmar opened its doors to the internet, which revolutionized everything. Immediately, a previously sheltered population was suddenly left to navigate the complexity of the web all on its own. Fake news about minorities, especially the Rohingya, attacking Buddhist holy sites spread all over the country, resulting in increased hate crimes towards ethnic minorities, deaths, and the largest modern exodus of refugees. All I've heard of Myanmar is how foreign agencies are there to support, but I came to Yangon to see if and how local Burmese were fighting to fix the ethnic divide and build a new Myanmar. Yo guys, welcome to Yangon. It's an amazing place, totally surprised me. It's got everything, it's got chaos, it's got soul, vibrant, it's incredibly diverse. It's also an ancient city and you can feel the history. Um, I'm in the streets now. Now, I've been told that I shouldn't speak to anyone about anything potentially controversial. But if I want to get to know a place and the people in it, I can't help myself. Guys, you know me. I'm gonna give it a try anyway. So as a foreigner, we hear that there might be like problems amongst different people of different beliefs. Is that the case or really is it very different? She's scared, she's now. Okay, 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 cool. But um So she can't say anything, she won't be able to say anything. So currently in the park trying to find some people to talk to, proving very difficult. One Burmese are just generally quite shy and timid people. But finding it difficult to get people to talk to me, also finding it difficult to get some truthful reflections on a deeper level. But not everything is bad news because I managed to get in touch with an amazing, prominent and well-known activist who's been championing the cause of ethnic minorities here in Myanmar. Um, she's won international awards, she's been featured in many articles and for some reason she agreed to sit down and chat to me. So I'm super excited because it means I'll be able to get some expert knowledge on what it's like for ethnic minorities here in Myanmar. Mm -hmm. Get it. Yo guys, we are currently at the courthouse and security here is pretty tight so it's very difficult for me to to film anything without getting caught so I'm gonna have to be really really discreet so we are here because we trying to we will face the trial in the court this afternoon yeah. uh, because we organize a protest peaceful and lawful protest the day we got charged it was so ridiculous we don't want to be violent as well it's a peaceful protest but in the end the police came in and tried to arrest us so people are quite scared and they were like running around and they trying to beat the people as well with their better all day for 24 hours they were detained in the prison are you, it was too much. Are you like worried about it? Are you like scared or concerned or something? Law is not majestic. We need to make it majestic. Yeah, so yeah. we have to protest against this. That's the way because laws are made by the people. But aren't you, aren't you like worried that one day they just might put you in jail? That's the way we have to go. There's no other option. You can come in. You can come in. Main. You can come and check and observe. You can even sit down in the court. Okay. But um, you're not allowed to use the phone or mobile. Okay. All right. That I'm not gonna understand anything, but it'd be interesting to witness what you have to go through every single week. But fine, absolutely, I'm down. So I'd love to. I wasn't allowed to film inside the courtroom, so I caught up with Finza afterwards. So being an activist in Myanmar is not easy, mm -hmm. and uh, so I'm fighting for the rights of the minority people and the oppressed, making sure. The military dictatorship is out of our political boundary and it's not happening yet. I was raised in the military compound actually, the whole my family, they will... Oh, wow. Yeah, I, my father himself as an army officer and I used to be extremist, I can say that. Like to, for example, I was totally against Rohingya because yeah. that's the only thing that I know. So I can understand the other side, why they are thinking that way. Yeah. We just follow, because we have that information. That information is the only thing that we eat. Yeah. I never met Rohingya outside, yeah. so I don't care. They are nothing related with me. Even if I condemn them, mm, I, will, I will not lose any of my rights. 
So that's the mindset that we used to have. So who was giving you this information? Where were you getting yeah. it from? No, on social media. Oh, so social media was spreading false information. Yes. What kind of what kind of things were being spread? Like the information about Rohingya people, for example, yeah. and also other different information about Muslim people. Because yeah. usually we think if people are more connected, mm -hmm. then it leads to a more liberal and progressive society. But in this case, it actually divided people more. They just circulated things that they want to know. It created another clout yeah. among themselves. That's also a nature of social media. You know, people, uh, social media will connect you with the similar people, similar yeah. idea. Yeah. Somebody shares something, that's why Buddhism is the best. Mm. And then you share it and you believe in that because you're Buddhist. Yeah. At the same time, you raise yourself, at the same time, you condemn the other minorities. How do you solve that problem in the sense that people are circulating um, invalid information, yeah. Yeah, fake yeah, news? Yeah. 15 million in Myanmar, almost half of them have that devices, smartphones. We just have the devices in hand, but we don't know how to use that. Oh, like digital literacy. Digital literacy, yeah. digital education, there is nobody provided that. So I think we can strengthen that. We can create that culture, social media culture, and we can make a social media, social impact based on that. Yo guys, so I'm at the Central Mosque, and I wanted to come here because as a Muslim, I guess I'm able to relate to this ethnic minority more than others. As a Muslim, I know what it's like growing up in the West to be subject to lots of misrepresentation or people not quite understanding who we are in essence. And that's also similarly the case here. A lot of the hatred towards ethnic minorities is bred out of ignorance. I've had nothing but hospitality, nothing but smiles and people coming up to me and asking me where I'm from. What's your name? Nader. Nad Nader. Nader. Uh, nice to meet you. 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 Before they born, before they build up, but now. We used to have that tolerant community, actually. That's really interesting. Historically. Yeah, yeah historically, we used to. We're not, we are like pluralist society before. Yeah. Good morning, folks. It's the stroke of sunrise. We are here at Shwedagon, which is the holiest site in Yangon, and it's beautiful. But there's something about spiritual places that I feel extremely familiar in, even though I'm not Buddhist. It just doesn't feel so alien to me. I mean, I grew up going to like religious places, especially mosques, and there was always a sense of like familiarity. In <laughs> He's got a person who wants to take a picture with me. Let's go. This is to be there. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate a six foot three guy here. It's quite a rare thing. It just kind of makes me think how. In these spaces, religion is such a peaceful, beautiful thing. But how easily it can be manipulated or, or exploited to cause such divide and violence between people. Imagine we took this peacefulness and this serenity and transferred it into how we interact with people who are different to us. Ultimately, that is the essence of religion, translating that into our real lived life experiences. And I think that applies to every religion. I personally love it when people come to my places of spirituality or worship and pay respects. So every time I go somewhere new, I like to do the same. Throughout my trip, mm -hmm. I've been told not to mention the Rohingya people. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because mm. you are a foreigner. You have your rights in your... Your embassy will protect you if something mm. happened to you. I hope so. <laughs> right, <laughs> I think <laughs> so. <laughs> I never realized that Burmese don't actually accept the word Rohingya. Actually, like, that, that's the whole controversy behind it. I feel like that we need to train people using the, consistently using the word. That's how I feel. Yeah. Because I believe in human rights. Everybody has a right to name themselves. How they want to be called. So I believe in exposing, challenging, questioning. So I think that's the thing that I can do 
the best for the people in the you know oppressed areas. So your mindset was shifted when you had conversations with friends. From yes, people, right? stories matter. They are story changed my life. They they shape my values. Stories do matter, and throughout my whole trip, it had been so difficult to get people to open up to me about theirs. But it wasn't until my last five hours in Myanmar when I met a Rohingya man and his Burmese neighbor. How long have you known each other? About 10 years. Oh wow. About 20 years. Oh wow. About 10 years. So old friends. Old friends. <laughs> Almost 10 years ago, the Burmese man had resented the Rohingya people. But when one moved right next door to him, he made his life difficult with slurs and suspicion. But over a period of time, he was taken aback by his efforts for the community. The Rohingya man had tirelessly started a project to mentor kids of all ethnicities together. Oh, Rumus, very nice to meet you. Yes, nice to meet you. <laughs> and what's your name? My name's Jolo. Jolo, nice to meet you. And your name? My name is Tomila. Oh, such good English. Yeah. The English is so good. good. <laughs> My name is Tomila. 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 Tomila, nice to meet you, nice to meet you. And your name? The Burmese man was so touched by his tireless efforts, he eventually donated his whole property to him and his work. Now the two are best friends and their work continues together. Hi! <laughs> yeah. Okay, your turn. What's this one? And so I wanted to know yeah. what are some of the challenges that ethnic minorities have to go through here in Myanmar? Not freedom of movement, prohibited from the health service, superior health service. Sometimes I'm very sad because of departuring from my original family. If I have positive, they will be positive. It's the theory. I'm doing for the next generation of the, all the ethnic, like Bambi, Kachinkai, all the youth in the future will be harmony. It's my hope. Yeah. State not to our ethnicity, we should state only humanity. Stories are powerful. It lifts the veil of ignorance and contributes to making the unheard feel included and connected. Myanmar is a complicated and delicate political landscape. But perhaps part of the solution is easier than we think. Perhaps it's real stories from the people's hearts that will cut through all the misinformation and hate. Maybe. <laughs> that was amazing. It was so nice. Just, oh man. Just experience the hospitality. And just stuff like that. Just, I'm so grateful for my life to be able to like witness kindness that authentic and really touches me to see how much people have to go through and the resilience that they have and my heart is going to explode.